Well, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're still in our greeting, verse 1 and 2. Last week we focused on the author and the recipients. We just looked at, at those two ideas. I think it's helpful for us to keep in mind Paul's background. And so even, even I would encourage you this week to take the time, if you haven't done so, to, to reread Acts, those important sections from chapter 18 through 20, to reflect upon Paul's time in Ephesus there. But you keep in mind his suffering as well throughout all three of his missionary journeys, and because it, it colors everything that he says in all of his epistles. Um, but ultimately, we know from his opening here that he received his authority not because of his experiences, but because it came from God. It was by the will of God that he was an apostle. And so the recipients then are faithful saints in Ephesus. We talked about about his interest in them, obviously over spending three years in ministry there, calling them faithful, acknowledging that he is confident that God is continuing to work in their midst and that they are continuing to place their hope and trust in him and that they are growing in maturity. And yet we also looked ahead to Revelation chapter 2 and read there where we see that this was a church who had lost their first love. And so that really within a, a brief time frame, they went from described as faithful to faithless. And it's important to keep that warning in mind because any church is really one generation away from that same description. So before we read this greeting again, let's ask the Lord for his help in understanding it. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful that you speak to us through your word, that you have given us this special revelation. Lord, we can look outside and see your glory and your grandeur and your beauty and order in creation, and we can acknowledge you and, and praise you for that, and yet there is something special that you've revealed to us in your word, that apart from your word, we don't understand the gospel. We cannot have a right relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, and so we pray that you would give us eyes to see that truth this morning. Give us ears to hear it. Soften our hearts to respond in obedience to it. For your glory, we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Read with me Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, in 1937, Harvard Medical School re received a large donation from Billy Grant, or W.T. Grant, as you may have heard. He was um, famous for having a franchise of 25 cent stores across the nation. He'd built his wealth through that company. And he wanted to conduct, conduct a study. He wanted to give back generously uh, to, to Harvard Medical School, but also he had a, a motive there to, to figure out what makes people successful, what would make them good store managers for his, his company, or at least the smartest employees that he could hire. So that was why he, he gave this donation, and while Harvard kind of maybe frowned upon the crass nature of the donation, he, they were also thankful because it came at a time when they themselves were wanting to study what makes healthy young men. And so this study has now been ongoing. They started a lo longitudinal study, which is just an ongoing study. It's been going for 85 years now. It's been, it was originally called, uh, I think, just the Grant Study, but now it's called the Harvard Study of Adult Development. And uh, you can read about this in several articles. You can look it up online. There's in several books that refer to it. But Charles Duhigg in Super Communicators draws attention to two of the participants um, named Godfrey Camille and John Marsden. And in the early remarks of the researchers, all of the remarks regarding Camille were that he came from a dysfunctional home 
He had um, a mother who was very anxious and worried about him, and all of that obviously transferred to him, where he was finding himself in the infirmary all the time, worried about his health. Uh, one of the doctors thought, thought uh, what did they, they, they said it was a psychotic, like, um, obsession that he had for his health. He was worried about that. He would have a very difficult life, according to all of the researchers. They just, based on this pattern in his life, he was not going to have an easy life. While Marsden came from a wealthy and prominent family, everyone knew the name, and he seemed to be primed for success. In the years following graduation, both of them enlisted in World War II. And after his honorable discharge, Camille went to medical school, went to Harvard Medical School. Shortly after his graduation, he attempted to commit suicide. So still struggling and suffering from depression and despair. Marsden went to law school, graduated near the top of his class, got married, and started a private practice. And so by all expectations, these two are just going to continue down their paths, one spiraling downward and, and going into worse and worse poverty and depression, the other finding success. But of course, I wouldn't be telling you the story if that was the, the way this ended, right? Later researchers followed up in the early 70s, and they found that the, the lives of these two men entirely flipped. Camille was happily married with children who adored him and had a thriving allergy treatment clinic. He even was recognized nationally for the, the success of his treatment. Marsden, on the other hand, was divorced, alienated from his wife and children. Admittedly, his law practice was successful, but he had very few friends and spent most of his time isolated and alone and was depressed. And so whenever they followed up with their questionnaires, they would respond and Camille would consistently find himself at the very top of the list in terms of his satisfaction and happiness with life. And Marsden was at the very bottom, depressed, anxious, worried, unhappy with his relationships. And so the fourth facilita facilitator of this study who continues to do so now is named Robert Waldinger or Waldinger. He says, the clearest message we get from this study is this, good relationships keep us happier and healthier. The quality of your relationships is more important than the quantity of them. Social isolation, the researchers wrote, was more dangerous than diabetes and a host of other chronic diseases. And so they asked the question, Waldinger asked the question, how satisfied are you with your relationships? According to the study, that is the single most important factor in determining happiness and health. Not the way you were brought up. I mean, your life can completely flip based upon your current relationships and your satisfaction in those relationships. Well, of course, the most important relationship is our vertical relationship with God. But that does have significant implications for our relationship with one another, the horizontal relationships. So if we love God, we will learn to love his people whether they live in our home, in our church, or in the world. And so I would change the question just a little bit here and say, how satisfied are you with your relationship with God and one another? Recognizing the foundation is your relationship with God, but the implications ripples into your relationship with everyone else. Paul's greeting in the to, to the Ephesians teaches us that God supplies the grace and peace that we need to be satisfied now and forever. The greeting is not unique. This greeting is, is the same in all of his epistles. Grace and peace are found in every single one of them. There's a few tweaks on the other words there, but it always includes grace and peace. They serve as themes that we'll find in the letter of Ephesians. <clears throat> and I think it also can be used to represent the divisions. And so as we think about these two great themes of Ephesians, I want to put it like this. Chapters 1 through 3 talk about salvation through grace. Salvation through grace. And then the latter half of the epistle, verse, chapters 4 through 6, are peace with God and man. So salvation through grace and then peace with God and man found in chapters 4 through 6. So let's begin with these, this first point, salvation through grace. 
Again, the, the typical greeting here be, for Paul begins with the word grace or charis. But this is actually a spiritual infusion of the common greeting at the time, which, which would have been chirene. It was, uh, was how the typical Greek would open their letter. It's, it's really just like saying greetings. Uh, or the literal translation would be rejoice. But it was how you would have sent an, or you would have opened a letter to anyone you were sending it to. Obviously, Paul takes it to a, spiritual, uh, to a spiritually significant level. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, and in this first half of Ephesians, it's typically used regarding our relationship with God through Christ. That is primarily what we're going to focus on for the first half of this sermon series. It will be, how do we understand, what do we believe about our relationship with God and the relationship that we have through Christ? In verse 7 of chapter 1, what do we see? It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So the redemption and forgiveness that we have through the blood of Christ is described as the riches of God's grace. Again, it's this, this grand language that we find in this epistle that continues to lift us up out of our present circumstances and cause us to reflect upon these heavenly spiritual realities. In chapter 2, verses 4 through 9, we see another significant section where God's mercy is shown in his great love that was extended to us who were dead in our sin. It teaches us by grace you have been saved. You've been saved. You've been raised up with Christ. You've been seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so he'll continue to show the immeasurable riches of his grace. You see this similar language there in Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. And then in chapter 3, verses 7 through 8, you have Paul's gospel ministry described as a reflection of God's grace given to him that he might preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, what's he doing in the first three chapters? He's... He's searching the riches of grace and Christ. He's, he's meditating upon these things. He's, he's helping us to do that, to reflect upon this great and glorious truth. And so grace is the theme of this first half. It lays out the indicatives of the believer. It's, what, it's who we are in Christ. That phrase, in Christ, is found 38 times in Ephesians. It's, it's the most common phrase in all of Paul's writing. God is uniting all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. And so it's a message of reconciliation. It's a message of having peace with God through his son. The fact that this grace comes from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ here in this greeting implies something about the Son's equality with the Father. We can even see a hint here of the Trinity in this opening. The Greek word Lord is the same word that's frequently found in the Greek version of the Old Testament called the Septuagint, which refers to Yahweh, the personal name for God. So Jesus is truly God and truly man. Now, Christians in, Eph in Ephesus, much like those in Colossae, if you're coming to the Wednesday night study, they were surrounded by the occult. They were surrounded by false teaching, by false practices, false religions. But because he reminds them here that they are in Christ, he, he doesn't spend a whole lot of time here describing the occult. He just gives them confidence of who they are in Christ knowing that, that they don't need to fear if they recognize their union with Christ. They don't need to fear the occult. Well, one recent study uh, that polled millennials on their major life goals uh, recognized that it, it polled them in, in 2019 and then did it again in 2023. Within four years, the number of major life goals jumped from five to 12. And they, they had maybe... A, a more refined idea of what they wanted to do and be. Uh, and, but as they, as they got older, they realized there, there were more things to life that they wanted. 
And their life goals often change dramatically over time, but becoming rich and famous remains in the top half of that list. This is true despite every celebrity telling us that money and fame do not buy happiness. Now, why do we continue to prioritize goals that show little correlation to satisfaction even by secular studies? Well, that question was included in the survey as well. Social media was, a, was, in the, was one of the top three drivers of life goals. Reflecting upon the, the stuff that you come across on social media, not a very good idea, okay? But also, everyone is influenced by their community, by the networks to which they belong, whether that's just their family, whether it's their classmates, whether it's their church community. They're influenced to make life goals based upon those affiliations, those connections. And so in a different study of this same demographic conducted by Barna, we find that only 33% of young adults said they felt deeply cared for by those around them. Only 33% of young adults. So the older portion of these young adults would be in that millennial category. But in other words here, so if you're combining these studies, which is probably you're not supposed to do, but I do it anyways, they're influenced to set their life goals. The most influential people in setting their life goals are those who most don't think care about them. Most don't feel that they're deeply cared for by those who are giving them their life goals. And if the quality of our relationships is significant in determining what we prioritize, then young adults should prioritize finding a church community, a church home that's filled with people who will deeply care for them. That also implies something about this church home and our responsibility to care for those who come. So it should go without saying, if we deeply care for someone, then we will point them to the most important relationship they can ever have, a relationship that's only found through, by grace through faith, a relationship with God. So have you found the riches of God's grace through the unsearchable riches of Christ? And are you continuing to pursue to understand more and more about God? Through Christ. See, Ephesians contains language that compels us to meditate upon the kindness, the saving mercy of our loving Lord. Paul teaches us to make spiritual realities our priority, recognizing that all of God's blessings are found in Christ. We're going to see that when we look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Everything we have, spiritually speaking, is from Christ, is because of Christ. And so you, you've heard me speak of the ordinary means of grace. Right? We want to be a church that emphasizes the word, sacraments, and prayer. And so we preach the word, keeping Christ central in every sermon. That's what makes it a Christian sermon. We sing the word, declaring the truth of the gospel with our mouths, our minds, and our hearts. We meditate upon Christ's redeeming work in the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we fill our worship with prayers from beginning to end. Prayers of invocation, confession of sin, thanksgiving, general pastoral prayers, prayers of illumination before we read God's word. And then close with a prayer filled with the implications of the sermon. See, if these are the means of God's grace, then we want to saturate our worship service with them from beginning to end. This also implies something about your engagement in each element of the worship service. And there's not a, a point where you disengage. You're always participating. Whether you're responding to God's call, lifting your voice in song, praying in agreement, actively participating in the sacraments, listening to the word of God. See, each element of the worship service is training. It's equipping you for communion with God. 
according to the means by which he is prescribed. And so what motivates your participation? It's, it's probably mo- not me telling you how important it is. That's probably not what motivates you. It's probably not me explaining why we do each element, and that might be helpful for some of you, but it's probably not what motivates you to keep doing it. No, what will consistently motivate your participation is a sense of holy reverence and true humility that accompanies our communion with God, who is immeasurably rich in grace. It's, in other words, an experience of that communion with him. Those who truly commune with him will be changed. And in the process, it transforms everything you do, everything you think, everything you say, every relationship that you have. And so this is a benediction, grace, grace to you. His benediction to the Ephesians comes right up front. They were the recipients of the grace that comes from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. But we know that all who are faithful in Christ Jesus also receive that blessing of God's grace. And so that's the first point, salvation through grace. And it leads to the second point, point, peace with God and man. Peace with God and man. Again, we have a a very common um, greeting, the word shalom. It would be peace to you. That's where you, how it's translated in Luke 24, 36. Uh, it's also used in farewells, go in peace, in Judges 18, 6 and James 2, 16. So this was a common Hebrew greeting. In Greek, it's Irene. So Paul has combined this common Hebrew and Greek greeting and then infused them with spiritual significance. The word in Greek as in English, has two primary categories of usage. They have, you you might describe them as external and internal. Our common usage today probably flips that, so where the more common one is internal, sort of a a personal sense of well-being, and then external peace, and just meaning, you know, not at war, experiencing a physical peace. But, but the external peace between governments would be where there's a removal of peace, there's a plunging of nations into war. That's, that's how it's used in scripture. It doesn't merely imply, though, a ceasing of war. It also implies a, a peace that you can have between in, enemies or a peace that you can experience just in, in your relationships with, with others. In other words, it's an external peace. It's a peace that you actually experience physically where there's, not, there's no more fighting with one another. And then there's an internal sense of this, a state of personal well-being. This is the general meaning when it's used in greetings and farewells. But what we'll find throughout Ephesians is that Paul shifts from that internal well-being to a focus upon this peace that we have with God through Christ and therefore the implications of that peace in our relationships with others. Without this internal peace though, that we begin with, natural man will experience an endless struggle within his soul. That'll obviously manifest itself in a, in a, an anxiousness where, where there's a, there's a tension in relationship with others. If a, if a person is at war with his conscience, it's going to impact the way he lives. He fights an internal battle because of that lack of peace. And so it's even cliche to say there's a hole in our hearts. But it gets at the same idea. Every man has a moral compass, but no ability to point it true north apart from the help of the Holy Spirit. And so there becomes this recognition of a discontentment. A discontentment that really stems from a lack of peace with God. That is the man in his natural state. But Paul will extend a a blessing of internal peace in the greeting to those he's speaking to. And then he'll shift to that external peace in the body of the letter. Not to say that he'll never come back to that internal idea. But the focus will be upon this external peace. Ephesians breaks down into those two broad categories, chapters 1 through 3 and chapters 4 through 6. But you could also use the language of indicatives and imperatives, who we are in Christ or what we believe 
about Christ, and then how Christians behave. It's the imperatives, it's the commands that follow, the implications of our relationship with Christ. So peace indicates reconciliation in both halves, but Paul makes his theological case in the first half. It's the relationship with God, which is then followed by practical implications in the second half. And so I just want to point out a few examples. In chapter 2, we're going to see that God had brought peace between Jews and Gentiles, making them one by his death on the cross. So he's brought us together as one people in his church. This is the foundation of his theological argument, pointing us back to Christ. Every other relationship is to be experienced in light of that relationship with God through his son. Because God has reconciled us to himself, he is also reconciling us to one another. If we are all personally and individually united to Christ, then what does that imply about our relationship to one another? That we're necessarily united together. Secondly, you'll see in the latter half, in light of what God has accomplished through his son, Paul urges readers to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, Ephesians 4, 1. So we should be eager, he says, to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. That's that horizontal peace now. The unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. We're not maintaining our relationship with God He's accomplished that peace, and he maintains it. There is a call to maintain that peace in the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace among one another. And he doesn't even seem to be addressing a known problem. He doesn't acknowledge, hey, I I know there's conflict. I know there's factions among you. I know there's tension between two parties. He doesn't have something specific in mind, which tells me that this is just a common problem he anticipates being present in every community that might read this letter. So as members of this church, we've committed ourselves with public vows to study the church's purity and peace. And then in the very last chapter, Paul acknowledges this spiritual battle that is taking place behind the scenes of our earthly struggles. We must put on the shoes of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6.15. Paul makes the allusion, apparently, to Isaiah 52.7, where the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace. It's a reference to those who evangelize, who bring the good news of Christ to others. So he isn't merely talking about missionaries and pastors here. He's writing to the whole church, to everyone. To be ambassadors for Christ. Now, history proves that Christianity transforms cultures. Even the secular author Tom Holland came to this conclusion, not Spider Man, the, the historian, the author, no relation to the actor. But he came to the conclusion that what makes good society finds its roots in Christianity not Greek Stoicism or Roman political philosophy. Now, he grew up in an Anglican church, but was always fascinated by the villains in Scripture. Right? He wanted to be like Goliath. He always had an affinity to those who were, who were wicked or evil, and I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's somewhat common, I, I guess. But he, he, as he matured, he really kind of rejected his upbringing. And he wanted to study those he was fascinated with, which was Romans and Greeks. And he really was enamored by that history. But as he began studying it and writing about it as a historian, he realized that everything he loved about life, everything that actually made society good, was not rooted in history in Rome and and in Greece. It was rooted in Christianity. And he had to come to that admission. He says, the relationship of Christianity to the world that gave birth to it is then paradoxical. The faith is at once the most enduring legacy of classical antiquity 
and the index of its utter transformation. And yet many in the world continue to reject the foundational truth of the gospel, including Tom Holland. He says he's a Christian morally and ethically, but he, can't, he doesn't see any reason to, to believe in God. And that's what a lot of people are doing. They're, they're recognizing they want the benefits of Christianity without the commitment, without the trust, or with the relationship with God. They recognize the, the message of peace entailed in the death of Christ. They've even heard the gospel, but they reject the spiritual significance of it and just want to take away the moral and ethic value, ethical value. And so what makes Christianity so revolutionary is that it achieved peace not only between God and man in Christ's death on the cross, but it also makes peace possible even within a corrupt society. And as Christianity's influence expands, it promotes a superior alternative to the depravity in the culture. And more and more people can see that and recognize it. But however beneficial a cultural Christianity would be for society, it could only ever achieve a very temporary satisfaction. And really, they would be impossible goals set before someone to try to have peace and enjoy peace with man, but not have peace with God. Again, to live out of that anxious struggle in their soul is not going to make it easier to somehow find peace with one another. And so following a written law, one that's not been engraved in the heart, as Ezekiel says, can only lead to further condemnation, and it attempt, it's an attempt to enjoy external peace without finding internal peace. And so this scenario would have been unthinkable for Paul. The only hope of horizontal peace with one another is the possession of vertical peace with God, with true and lasting peace. And that does have implications for marriage, for friendship, maybe even for places of work, and absolutely for the church. It is because of our union with Christ that we can experience unity where there was once hostility. The implications of knowing peace with God is that we pursue peace with our fellow man out of gratitude for what Christ has done for us. And so in our home, if your home has become a hostile environment, which many homes are, Remember how Christ entered into the hostility of his fallen world and brought peace through the sacrifice of his life. The only the gospel brings hope into the home. Is coming to church filled with tension due to difficult relationships? Remember the humility and the gentleness and the patience that Christ showed you while you were his enemy. And then extend the same to those who have offended you. And do you have conflict with your neighbors? Remember that Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. And so his example teaches us how to walk in love toward outsiders. You see, we become imitators of God as we read in Ephesians 5.1, as we worship him. So grace and peace, peace is the benediction that we need to hear. It isn't a wish or even a prayer. It's a blessing based upon the sure promises of God. God promises to bless his people with grace and peace. And therefore, we ought to receive his blessing and commit ourselves to the implications of it for the rest of our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your promises. We thank you for your blessing of grace and peace, for this benediction that we will close our worship service with. I pray that we would receive it. And not just receive it for our own good, but to recognize that it has implications for how we live, the things we pursue, 
the world knows how important relationships are, and yet it has a broken way of pursuing healthy relationships. We want to begin with our relationship with you, be humbled by that, and then in gratitude pursue and love those whom we have offended, to be forgiving of those who have offended us. Lord, may the message of gospel reconciliation be a defining theme, not only of Ephesians, but as we wake our way through this series, may it begin to define this church as we seek to honor and glorify you. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.